Father, we thank you. In this place, Lord, your people are hungry. We ask you, God, to come in this room, make yourself uh, noticeable to our hearts, to our minds, to our bodies. Lord, we pray that you'd come and bring freedom. Come and do what only you can do. Lord, we pray that you'd break chains, break bondages, Lord. We pray that you'd come and help our hearts to be open, our hearts to be soft, to receive the word that you have for us tonight. It's in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, I just have a quick question for you guys to start things off tonight. I wanted to ask you guys, has anybody ever, ever had a really bad haircut? Okay, almost everybody in the room. I, I've also had a really bad haircut. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture, but I do have pictures of a couple other people uh, that I found on the internet that have terrible, terrible haircuts. Can you put that first one up there, Carter? Here's one. That's pretty gnarly. It looks intentional, that's the problem. It's, it's not, that doesn't happen on accident. There's no way that happens on accident. Can we put the next one up there? Here's one. I'm not sure about that one. I, I, it's like poodle-esque. I don't know what the style is there. Go ahead and put the next one up there. That's, that is sexy. Grace, Grace take notes on this lady. That's a 10 right there. Now Grace, if you shaved your head like that, you'd be an 11. Right now she's a 10, but she'd be an 11 if she shaved her head like that, right Grace? That's my wife back there. Can we give it up for Grace? She puts up with me, which is great. Put the next one up there. That's really good. It's a rat. You ever heard the term a rat tail at the bottom of you know, the back of your neck and it kind of curls up and you keep it long? That takes it to a whole nother level, right? And we have one more up there, I believe. Oh, two more, sorry. This is, this, this is the second to last one. I also hear mullets are coming back. Is that true? Are mullets coming back? Why? Somebody tell me why. After service, come find me. If you have an explanation for this, I'd love to hear it. Last one. This one. Now, he, now that's an accidental bad haircut, and it reminds me of a story of a time in my life where I also got a really bad haircut. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture like I said, but this picture right here reminds me exactly what happened on uh, Halloween last, or excuse, it would have been like three or four years ago. I was still living with my parents before I got married, and, and I had um, no time to go to a barber shop. I had no time to go get a haircut professionally because we had our big Trip to Hell production, which is actually coming up uh, October 30th and 31st. I encourage you guys to come to that. 30th is the uh, 7 p.m. At, on Saturday night and Sunday morning, 9.30 and 11, and then a Sunday night show as well at 7 p.m. So I encourage you guys to come to that. It's an awesome production. But I remember a couple years ago, we were preparing for this production, and I do worship here, and, and I was playing guitar, and so I knew that there was gonna be a lot of people here more than normal. I knew that I was gonna be seen by a bunch of people, and, and, and I, so I was like, I need to get this haircut right. And unfortunately, because I didn't have time, I had to go to my mom, which normally isn't a problem. Because my mom actually isn't that bad at giving haircuts. Has anyone ever had a mom cut before? When I was a kid, she used to just buzz it, which is fine. But I asked her for a little bit more of a difficult haircut. Not too bad. Short on the sides, long on the top. Would have been super simple if she remembered to put the guard on. And luckily, she started at the back, not like this young gentleman here. She started at the back, and she was, you know, getting the sides and stuff like that. She had like a guard one which is really short for those of you who ever cut your hair with a one guard. And she was cutting my, the sides of my head with, with a one and she went to cut the top, which was really long at the time, and she didn't change the guard. She didn't change it to a longer one. She just kept the one guard on. And so she did a big stripe right up the back of my head up to about the middle of my scalp. And I had no clue what happened. All I know is she, her jaw dropped and so did the razor. That's how I know it was bad. And I knew it was really bad when I was like, what? I'm sure it's not that bad, what? And then my dad comes in from the other room into the kitchen where I was having my hair cut, and he starts just hysterically laughing at me. And I was like, this is not the way to tell me that my haircut is bad. Right before this event, we have hundreds of people coming here. I'm gonna be on stage. Like, I'd have to keep my, I'd even have to wear a hat or face forward only and never turn around because the back of my head looks like the, like the, the split Red Sea, right? And, and because they didn't take the guard off, it was a terrible, terrible haircut and luckily I had just enough time I, I didn't think I had time but my mom gave me money she's like here just go up to best cuts really quick it's right down the street see what they can do luckily they did the best that they could it wasn't terrible but it was a bad haircut ever say bad haircut and there's a verse that reminds me of this in Ecclesiastes how many of you guys are thinking right now how in the world does a bad haircut remind you of anything in the Bible whatsoever but I'm going to show you right here, right now. Ecclesiastes 1.9, it says, history merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Not even bad haircuts are new. And I know that because there's a story in the Bible of a man in the Old Testament who had a really bad haircut. 
And many of you guys know the story. I'm not going to tell you the man's name until we start reading. I'm sure once I start reading, you're going to uh, realize. But we're going to turn back in our Bibles to the book of Judges. Has anybody ever heard of that book before? For those of you who are new to the Bible, you maybe haven't read all the way through. You maybe haven't read this book. The book of Judges is a really entertaining book. The whole premise of the book of Judges is just God raising up a person after person after person after person to set the Israelites free from captivity. What happens next is he raises up this person to set them free. They called them judges. They set them free, and then the Israelites are free for a while, and then they start being stupid again. They stop following the Lord, and they get back into slavery, and God has to do it all over again. And that is literally the entire book of Judges. It, it literally goes, judge, freedom, stupidity, repeat. I have a slide for that, yeah. Judge, freedom, stupidity, repeat. This is the entire book of Judges. And the story that we're about to dig into tonight is a story of a man, one of the judges that God raised up, one of the more famous judges that God had raised up to set Israel free from the Philistine people that were ruling over them at the time. And so it's in the book of Judges, chapter 13. I'm going to start with verse 3. It says this, The angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, Even though you have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. So be careful. You must not drink wine or any alcoholic drink, nor eat any forbidden food. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut. There was a condition. Anybody get that? There was, there was a condition to this young man's birth, and it was that his hair was never to be cut. I'm sorry about that. For he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. And when her son was born, she named him Samson. Everybody say Samson. Samson. And the Lord blessed him as he grew up. Now the Hebrew meaning of the name Samson means son child. S-U-N child. And, and I believe this is a prophetic name because as God would raise him up like the sun gets brighter as it rises, Samson would get stronger as he was raised as well. That was the whole premise of, of Samson. Samson was never to cut his hair. He was never to break these certain laws. He was dedicated to the Lord, and God promised them that he was going to make him the strongest man in all of Israel, and that's what he grew up to be. And Samson did a lot of crazy things. Samson, during a lion attack, randomly one day a lion attacked Samson, and he just, the Bible says, the spirit of the Lord came upon Samson powerfully, and he ripped the lion's jaws in half. That's pretty intense. I don't know about you, but I couldn't even do that to a pit bull, let alone a lion, right? Let alone an alligator or something like that. Samson ripped the lion's jaws in half. That's pretty strong, but it gets even more intense. The next story that we see in the life of Samson is he kills 30 Philistine men just to pay off a bet that he lost. That's pretty serious. He bet some guys that they couldn't figure out one of these riddles that he made up. He said, I'll give you 30 cloaks and 30 pairs of this. And so he lost the bet because he was cheated by one of his, his girlfriends at the time. He lost the bet, and so he had to go and find 30 people that were wearing these robes, kill them, take their clothes, and then give them so that the bet could be paid off. That's pretty crazy. So he kills a lion, then he kills 30 men. Do you know how much strength it takes to kill 30 men that are all coming against you? That's pretty strong, right? I don't know very many people that could overcome two people trying to come against them, let alone 30, but it gets crazier. The next story we see, is he kills many more. The Bible doesn't give us a number, but it says many Philistines, so that's more than 30, many more Philistines in revenge for burning his wife and her father alive. That's pretty crazy. That's the only thing that I see in the life of Samson that may be justified. He retaliates by killing many of the enemy's soldiers. And then there's one more event in his life before his death that we see that I want to bring up. And it's one time he was in hiding in a cave because the Philistines were like, enough of this guy. He's killed so many of us. He, he's the enemy of our, of our enemies. He's the one guy that we need to take out more than anybody else, and he's hiding in a cave. And so his own people are like, you're making this worse for us. Here, we're going to take you to the Philistines. And he's like, all right. He lets them tie him up with new ropes. So he walks down this hill and, and out of the cave, and he's being tied, bound by ropes, and he gets down, and there's a thousand Philistine men waiting for him to capture him and kill him. And the, the Bible says they're all celebrating and they're saying hallelujah, probably not to the right God, but they're saying something like that. They're excited, they're celebrating, they're throwing a party because they finally captured this guy. Then the Bible says the spirit of the Lord came upon Samson mightily and he breaks loose of these ropes and he kills a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. 
He looks around. It's kind of like a bar fight is how I kind of imagine this. In a bar fight, you kind of just look around for a weapon. You grab a cue ball, you grab a pool stick, you grab a glass or a shot glass or something, you grab a chair, anything to kind of help you win this fight. And he looks around and all he sees is the jawbone of a dead donkey. He picks it up and he kills a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. It would be difficult to do that with a machine gun, let alone the jawbone of a donkey, but he does it because he's got this supernatural strength, this anointing from God, this strength that is ever increasing in his life. And we come to a very pivotal moment in his life. After he had killed these thousand Philistine men, he's all hyped up. He's like, this is amazing. This is probably the best thing I've ever done. And he goes on to say this, Samson was now very thirsty as he should be. He just killed a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. After that, I, I mean, I'm thirsty right now. And the only reason I'm not drinking is because I know that this is unopened water and I'm gonna have to take some time, set the microphone down, unscrew the cap and take a drink. He just did so much more than any of us have pretty much ever done in our entire lives. And now he's thirsty. And he says, and he cried out to the Lord, you have accomplished, now it sounds really good so far. You have accomplished God this great victory by the strength of your servant, which is a really humble way of saying I did it. It's a really humble sounding way of saying, it was my strength, God. Yeah, you might have done it through me, but it was my strength that killed these thousand men, that killed the lion, that killed the 30, that killed the many, that killed the thousand. It was my strength that did this. And it's really interesting because we see that after, we read after this story takes place and we can see what happens after because we're reading after the story is finished, we can read history, right? We're looking in the Bible, we can see this in, in a bird's eye view and we can see the end from the beginning. We know after it has already ended that the feat of strength was displayed through Samson was precursored with the phrase, every single thing, okay? Everything that Samson did with his strength in his life. The Bible says this, that the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him and then Samson did this. And then Samson killed 30 Philistines and then Samson killed the thousand. But it's always precursor with the phrase, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. Now it doesn't say that Samson mustered up his own strength because if he didn't need the Holy Spirit, if he didn't need the spirit of God to make him strong, then he wouldn't have, the Bible wouldn't have needed to put that there. We don't need to know that the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came upon him powerfully. That would have been completely unnecessary if it was his own strength, but it wasn't. And I feel like sometimes in our life, we can get so caught up in thinking about how strong we are because we've never actually been through anything really difficult. We can lean on our own strength because everything seems to be going well because we have these abilities, we have these, these talents, we have a job, we have experience, we have this, we have that, we've been living for this, this amount of years and we start to lean on our own strength. And this is honestly, I think the reason that so many people don't come to Christ is because they just don't think they need God. They lean on their own good works to get them into heaven. They lean on their own good character, right? To, to, to feel like I'm doing more good things than bad things. They're always leaning on themselves. That's what the world does. They lean on themselves for their strength. And this is what Samson is doing. Now Samson's supposed to be the one that delivers Israel. Samson is supposed to be a believer in the most high God, right? He's supposed to be this righteous man, but here we see him given a gift from God and then taking credit for it, becoming prideful in his life because it's his strength, quote unquote. Yet we see that the Bible tells us this is exactly the opposite. It's not his strength. It's the spirit of the Lord that comes mightily upon him. In fact, we see in another book of the Bible, it says it's not by power. It's not by might, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. This applies so greatly to the story of Samson. Samson, it's not by your strength that you did this. It's not by your might that you did this. It's by the spirit of the Lord. And it's not by our strength. It's not by our own constructions in our life, our own abilities, our own anointings, our own talents. It's not by anything we can do that we accomplish anything in this life. It's by the Spirit of the Lord that we accomplish anything worthwhile. Anything that is actually eternally valuable has to be accomplished through the Spirit and not through our own strength. And so we, we can apply this, this lesson to our life because it seemed like the stronger Samson got, the more prideful he became. Like the sun was rising. Right? It gets brighter as it rises. He's getting stronger as he rises. He's also getting more prideful as he rises. And the problem with pride is it's almost invisible to, to the human eye. It's almost invisible to the person experiencing it. Unfortunately, it's actually pretty visible to everybody around that person. I don't know about you guys. Have you ever seen a very prideful person and they just don't see it, but you see it like they're wearing it as a cloak, like it has it written on their forehead, like I am prideful. You can see it so obvious, but they can't see it themselves. Pride is so, is so deadly. In fact, there's a verse 
In the book of Ezekiel 28, 17, it says, your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty. This, a lot of scholars think this verse is speaking of Satan and his fall from heaven. Your heart was filled with pride because of all of your beauty. Your wisdom was corrupted by your love of splendor. So I threw you to the ground and exposed you. That's pretty intense. And I want to tell you tonight that God doesn't just expose Satan from heaven, right? He exposes us. And I don't know if you've ever experienced it before, but it's very uncomfortable when he exposes you. Have you ever been exposed by the Lord? Hopefully you've never had to be exposed publicly for some kind of secret sin going on in your life, some kind of secret thing going on in your heart. Hopefully he's never had to expose you publicly. I've been exposed publicly. I've been exposed privately, and I hated it every single time. And I'll tell you a little story in a little bit of a time where that happened to me very recently. But we see that Samson is becoming more and more prideful. And it's scary because now God says, if I want this man to turn back to me, I have to expose his pride. And so we see in his life, he's about to get exposed. Samson is about to have his heart of pride exposed, probably not to anybody else. Everybody else probably already sees it, already knows it. God obviously already sees it, already knows it, but Samson is about to have it exposed to himself. And it's not so that God can embarrass him. It's not so that God can, can laugh at him or, or harass him. It's so that God can purify him. And I want to tell you tonight that anytime God, God exposes some kind of sinful way in your heart, whether it be by conviction, by your conscience, by another believer, by, by the word of God, by the voice of God, no matter how he exposes sin in your life, I want you to know that God never does that to hurt you. He never does that to embarrass you. He never does that to make a show out of you in front of other people. He does it so that you can be purified. Because unexposed sin is sin that is unrepented of, and unrepented of sin is very dangerous in the life of a believer. You can't repent of a sin. You can't change your ways from a sin you don't know that you're doing. And so God first has to expose it in your heart before you're able to repent of it and find life for your soul. Before you're able to become more like Jesus and say no to that thing and yes to the thing that God has. But you need to know that he never does that to hurt you, to embarrass you. He does it because he's calling you higher. He's calling you to a higher plane of living. He's saying, I have not called you to live like the world lives. I have not called you to see people the way that the world sees people. I have not called you to hate in your heart just because something terrible happened to you. I have not called you to, to hate the church because you were hurt in church once. I have not called you to live like that. I have not called you to have an attitude like that. I have not called you to work lazily. I have not, I've not called you to have this perspective of your life. I have not called you to see yourself in the mirror and hate yourself. I have not called you to any of this. This is all worldly, demonic thinking. I have called you to a higher place, and he wants you to go higher. And that's the only reason God ever exposes something in you, so that he can take you higher. He wants you to have life and have life more abundantly, but first he has to expose your heart. He has to expose your heart. And we're going to see the story of Samson's exposure. And it's scary. And hopefully this never has to happen to any of us. Amen? Hopefully we can all just be good enough in our walk with God where we go alone with Jesus and we're reading the word and he confronts us in private so that we never have to be confronted in public. Hopefully we're all mature enough believers where we can go and spend time with the Lord, figure out what's going wrong with our life, correct it while we're alone with the Lord, go out into the world, live better, be better, live worthy of the grace that we've received. Like the Bible says, hopefully we can do that. But a lot of times it takes some kind of catastrophe in somebody's life for them to be exposed. I, I don't know of anybody who has come to the Lord because they were sitting on the beach one day in Tahiti with their beautiful 10 out of 10 spouse and they were laying down on the beach and they were getting a gorgeous tan. It's 75 degrees and sunny and, you know, they've got nothing to do all day. They took the two weeks off. They're just having the time of their lives. They've got all kinds of excursions booked. They, they just went jet skiing. They, they went deep sea fishing. They went, did all this exciting stuff. They got a spa day plan tomorrow. They're relaxed. They're having fun. I've never heard a story, a testimony of somebody who's living their best life right now and says, you know what? I need to just turn my life over to God. I've never heard it. And maybe, you, maybe your story is like that, and praise God, because I believe he can do that, but many, many people need to hit rock bottom before they realize I've got something wrong. There is something in my life that is off. There is some reason why I just cannot deal with life right now. I know that life isn't supposed to be with this, this way. I gotta find something higher than myself. 10 out of 10 times, I'm telling you, I've never heard it where everything's good and they turn to the Lord. I've always heard it, something terrible happened, some kind of crazy breakup. You had a really dark season of depression or anxiety. You had 
some kind of you know suicidal thoughts and you hit rock bottom and you sought help at the last moment saying, God, if you're really there, if you're really real, come and help me. I need your help. I need you to rescue me. I need you to prove to me that you exist, that you're real, that you love me. I've never heard somebody who got to rock bottom call out to the Lord and the Lord turn them away. It will never happen. It will never happen. But that's what I have to see so many times in people's lives is we have to have catastrophe. We have to have some kind of exposure to our hearts before we really repent and find life. And we're going to see that in, in Samson's life. In Judges 16, this is a couple chapters later, it says, Sometime later, Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah. Does anybody know Delilah? If you know Delilah, you just kind of cringed a little bit because you know what's going to happen to Samson. He fell in love with a woman named Delilah who lived in the valley of Sorek. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, Entice Samson to tell you what makes him so strong and how he can be overpowered and tied up securely. Then each of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. I know a, a man who is holier than Samson who was betrayed for much less silver than Samson was betrayed for. But this Delilah was bribed and enticed with money to give up this man that had fallen in love with her, to give up his secret of his strength, but that this time is his hair. If his hair is cut, he loses his strength. This is a condition of his strength, right? And so she, she receives this, and I don't see any sign of hesitation. We see this woman seems to be pretty evil. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me what makes you so strong. And I imagine she, had, she was scantily clothed when she said this because if she was wearing a sweatshirt and jeans or in, in sweatpants, she probably wouldn't have been enticing to Samson. But I bet you she was scantily clothed. I bet she put her perfume on. I think she did her hair and her makeup. And she's like, she's going to take him to, to Bone Town later on if she just tells me the secret. Samson, all you got to do is tell me the secret. She says this. Please tell me what makes you so strong and what it would take to tie you up securely. That is a very unveiled way of asking. Hey, Samson, what makes you so strong and what would it take to tie you up securely? What kind of person asks a person that question and, and doesn't expect to be fully exposed of their plans right off the get-go? But obviously he's delusional, he's blind, he's in love. How many of you guys know that love makes you blind and it's never good, right? Never, but never be blinded by love. If love blinds you, I promise you it's not real love, right? Real love will help you see clearly it will never blind you to do something stupid or, or, or anti-biblical or anti-Christ. He'll never, it'll never do that. So I just want to encourage you with that. But Samson lies to her, which is good, right? He, he doesn't just dump her, which would have been the best option, but he lies to her. She says, please tell me, as Samson replied, if I were tied up with seven new bowstrings that had not been dried, baby, I would become as weak as anyone else. And she's like, okay, that's all I need to know. And then we see... In, in the story that she's got all these Philistine soldiers hiding in a back room. And when he goes to sleep, she ties them up with the seven bowstrings. And she says, Samson, wake up. They're coming to attack you. And he wakes up and he busts out of these things and he destroys these guys and they get out of his house. And she's upset. She's upset because who wouldn't be embarrassed after that crap show of a plan? She goes back. She says, you've been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now, please tell me how you can be tied up securely because it went so well for him the first time. It's insane. Samson replied, if I were tied up with brand new ropes that had never been used, I would become as weak as anyone else. And so we see the same thing repeated. She's got these guys in a room and, and once he goes to sleep, she ties them up. She says, Samson, wake up. They're coming to capture you. He wakes up, he busts loose, he destroys the guys and then she's upset again. And it happens one more time. This time it actually gets closer to revealing the secret of his strength. He says, you know, if you were to tie my, the braids of my hair into a clothing loom and closed it on it, then I would lose my strength. And so we see that he's edging closer and closer to totally giving up the secret. And isn't that what sin does to us in our life? Sin starts as this abstract thing that we start with. It, it, it's harmless. He, he could break free of it. It's no problem. But then it starts to get more persistent. It starts to get closer and closer to home. And then all of a sudden you find yourself giving up the secret to your strength losing your relationship with the Lord, and you're totally entrapped and captured by your enemy, which is the devil. And he traps you in addiction, he traps you to, in sin, and he traps you in all kinds of things that, that he promised you so much and delivered so little. This is exactly what sin does, and we see it so, so clearly put in this story. And so it happens one more time. She comes to Samson, says, Delilah pouted. How can you tell me I love you when you don't share your secrets with me? 
you've made fun of me three times now and you still haven't told me what makes you so strong. And then this, this, is, this verse is funny. Verse 16, she tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick to death of it. I have no idea what that feels like at all. I have only been married for two years and it's been blissful. I, t I promise you nothing like this has ever happened to me ever. But she was so irritating to him. The Bible says this is actually hilarious how many times the Bible talks about an irritating wife. It's interesting how much it talks about it, probably because men wrote the Bible. Um, but, you know, we do call out men a lot in the Bible. Trust me, there's a lot about men getting called out for their sin in the Bible. So don't think the Bible is all sexist and all this woke crap because it's all a bunch of garbage. But she nags him day after day until he was sick to death of it. And he's like, all right, I kind of know what this is like because my baby sometimes hates the car seat and she screams. And if I have longer than a 20 minute drive, I start to kind of lose my cool a little bit. I kind of start to lose it, start twitching in my eye a little bit. And you start to lose a little bit of your self-control. And I can only imagine Delilah bothering him, nagging him all day, every day, day after day, until he finally breaks. He loses all patience. He loses his self-control and he tells her. It says, finally, Samson shared his secret with her. My hair has never been cut. He confessed, for, my, for I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as anyone else. And the Bible goes on to say, this time Delilah knew that he was telling the truth. Same thing happens. The Bible says she lulls him to sleep in her lap, cuts off his hair, calls in the enemy. He thinks it's going to be just like the other times I'm going to bust out because his faith was never really in God. He never really believed that if his hair was cut, he would lose his strength or he wouldn't have told her the secret. He didn't think this was about God. He had lived his whole life from nothing but strength. He said, this is going to be no different than the other times people have tried to bind me. Yet this time he loses all his strength. They overcome him. And it's really interesting because this happens in our life all the time. In Judges 16, 26, it says this. Then Samson... Oh, excuse me. Sorry. I got to get somewhere before that because this is, this is really important. I want to make sure I don't skip over things. Okay. Samson had been strong his whole life. Samson grew in pride as he grew in strength. Samson had never known what it was like to be weak until this moment. This is the first experience of his life that he can remember where he was as weak as any normal human being. But here he is in his weakness. And the problem with this is when you've only ever had strength, you never learn to lean on something stronger. And that is where I want to come to tonight. And that's the message for tonight. I want you to know that if you've only ever lived a life of your own strength, you'll never learn to lean and you'll never find life for your soul. You'll never find true strength until you learn to lean on something greater than you. What I mean by, by lean is in the Pro book of Proverbs 3, 5, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding, not on your own ways, not on your own wisdom, not on your own goodness. Don't lean on your own strength. Don't lean on your own abilities. Lean on the Lord in all of your ways. And it goes on to say, and he will make your path straight. Samson never learned to lean because he leaned only on his own strength. And many people never come to Christ because they live their entire life leaning on their own strength, never realizing that their strength is actually great weakness. Which is exactly why God has to expose our sinful and prideful hearts so that we can see the truth about our condition. Before any man comes to Christ, before any man finds eternal life, he has to first acknowledge, I am a sinner and there's nothing I can do about it. I have to come to God and say, God, you can do something I can't do. I have to admit, I'm weak. I can't save myself. I can't forgive my own sin. I can't live good enough to get to heaven. I can't do this on my own. I need to lean on your strength. I need to lean, lean on your sacrifice, on your blood, on your, your crown of thorns, on your nails and your wrists and your feet. I need to lean on your resurrection. I need to lean on your spirit, on your power, because my power will never be enough to do anything significant for eternity. My power will never be enough to set me free from addiction. My power may get me out of some situations, but I promise you, you'll never be truly free in your soul until you learn to lean. Turn to the person next to you and say, learn to lean. Learn to lean. And pr I promise you, if you learn to lean on God's strength before your strength fails you, your life will be much happier. If you have to be exposed, if you have to have some kind of catastrophe in your life happen for you to realize that you're weak, 
I promise you it's much less pleasant to experience than it would be if you would just come to the realization that I am weak and he is strong. I need him, not my own work, not my own power, not my own strength, but yours, less of me, more of you. That's where God wants all of us in this place. Whether you're, whether you're in a low or whether you're on a mountaintop, everything's going good, everything's going bad, it doesn't matter. The, the, the recipe is the same. You need to lean on Christ, the solid rock. All other ground is sinking sand. All other foundation is faulty. And it will fail you eventually. And if it doesn't fail you in this life and you never have this great collapse in life, guess what? You're going to have it after you die. Because any man that dies without Christ doesn't experience eternal life in heaven. You've got to pay for your own sin. If you leaned on your own strength your entire life, you've got to lean on your own strength for all of eternity. And guess what? It'll be, never be good enough to get you out of torment. It'll never be good enough to save you. It's never good enough which is why God has called out to us in the form of his son through this great love, this great sacrifice on the cross. Repent of your sins. Turn from your wicked ways. Realize you're weak, that you can't do this by yourself. Come to me. I will give you life. I will give you rest. I will save your soul. I will give you eternal life. Nothing else in the world can give this to you and nothing else can take it away. Come to me, all you who are weary. Right, if, if, if Samson never had this exposure of his life, if he never really realized that his strength was gone, it was never about his hair, it was never really about his, his muscle, his physique, he would have never realized that. He would have never come to God, but yet we see him come to God at the end of his life, and it's an incredible story. But before I get to it, I want to read you the verse that I almost jumped too quickly into. In the book of Judges 16, 19, it says this, Delilah lulled Samson to sleep with his head in her lap, and then she called in a man to shave it off, in this way, she began to bring him down, and his strength had left him. Has his life ever cut your hair? Has life ever cut your strength out from under you? Has life ever pulled the rug out from under your feet? Where you felt like everything that was stabilizing you beforehand is now just gone? Over the last month of my life, it has been the most joyous occasion. My, my wife just, my wife and I just had our, our first baby girl, and she was born, and she's healthy, and she's doing really good, and for that first week, I remember every time I would hold her, I would just begin to weep. I would cry because I was just so happy. I was so overjoyed. It was this incredible experience. But then the day I went back to work, I started having these tormenting, tormenting, evil thoughts in my mind about terrible things happening to my child. And it wasn't just this thought that I could kind of shoo away and ignore. It, this thought came with so much more. It came with some really intense physical symptoms. And for three days, my heart was racing, pounding out of my chest. For three days, I couldn't stop these incessant, persistent thoughts. For three days, I was shaking. For three days, I was weak. I couldn't eat. I was nauseous. My stomach was in knots. I felt like I was going to die. And I went to the emergency room. I'm telling you guys, this is a month ago. This is within the last month, the first week of my baby's life. I was in the emergency room because I thought I'm having a heart attack. And they give me this medicine and it all goes away and I'm feeling good. And then I get back out into life and it doesn't go away. And I have to go through the last month of my life has been the roughest month of my entire life. I hope this vulnerability on my part heals you in some way. I hope it brings freedom to you in some way because I have learned so much in the last month than I have. So much more in the last month than I ever have in my entire life. There were times where I, I would just be out driving, doing the simplest things, and all of a sudden this anxiety attack would come and it would hit me. That's what they diagnosed me with. It was situational anxiety disorder. And I was driving and me and my wife were going to Amish country with my parents and it was supposed to be this fun day and everything was really good in the morning and I'm just driving and all of a sudden my left arm goes numb and my, my head starts swimming and I, I feel like I'm gonna pass out. I genuinely feel like I'm going to die. I'm going to die right now and I'm gonna kill my wife and my baby because I'm driving the car. And so I pull over as quickly as I can and I try to shake it off. It doesn't leave and, and we go back home. And it was like this for every single day for probably the first three weeks. It wasn't until about last week that I really started to see some freedom in my life. And it was this crazy intense anxiety. Has anybody ever struggled with anxiety before in your life? It's real, man. And I, I, I came to the realization that I had belittled anxiety and depression so much Never with my words. I would always give it the credence it deserved in my words. But in my mind, I'm thinking like, yeah, it's just some bad thoughts. All you got to do is read the Bible and speak some scripture and it just goes away. Well, guess what? For three weeks, I spoke scripture. I shouted. I was in this room for hours, walking around the sanctuary, screaming worship songs, desperately crying out to God, and nothing was changing. Nothing was changing. My mind was just as bound as it was when I started. 
And if there's one thing I learned is that sometimes God doesn't take you out of the fire. He puts himself into the fire with you. Because I tell you what, I've never been closer to God in my entire life than I have been in this last month because I had to learn to lean not on my own understanding, to lean not on my own strength, to lean not on my own capability, but I had to lean on his strength. I had to lean on the power of his word. I had to lean on the promises of God. I had to lean on the faithfulness of God. I had to lean on the friendship of God that he would never leave me, that he would never forsake me, that this was not the end, that I had hope, that this is not going to last forever. I had these tormenting thoughts, but I would speak scripture after scripture after scripture, and it didn't happen right away, but I promise you, I saw freedom after about three weeks of my life, and I was still struggling with anxiety. In fact, I was struggling a little bit today because this anxiety would make it so, it was, it was so intense that I couldn't do the simplest thing. I couldn't drive. I was terrified to drive. In fact, the first time I drove, I had to rent a vehicle from Home Depot to drop off a bunch of tables and chairs. And it wasn't exactly the best way to ease back into driving. My mind was going crazy. My heart is pounding. I'm nervous. I'm sweating. I mean, I've been driving for 10 years. There's no logical reason that any of this should be happening. Yet here I am struggling to drive. I, I, I couldn't preach. That's the reason I haven't been up here. It wasn't because I was sick. It wasn't because my baby was born and I was taking time to be with my family. I tried to be here. But even the first time I tried to go back on stage, I was, felt like I was gonna pass out. I was so filled with anxiety, I couldn't handle it. And this is the first time in my life where I felt like I have no strength of my own to lean on. And I promise you, as much as it sucked, I would do it all over again to have the revelation that my strength will fail me eventually and that his strength is enough to pull me through. I'd live it all over again to be as close to God as I am right now. I would live it all over again to realize that it's not about my own strength. It's not about my ability. It's not about me driving for 10 years, so I should be fine. It's not about me leading worship for the last 10 years, so I should be fine. You know what I've been doing the last 10 years? I've been leaning on my own ability. And for the first time in my life, I can't just get on a stage without praying desperately that God would be with me. And I think that's the greatest gift that he could have ever given me. But sometimes life will cut your hair and it comes unexpectedly and it does not come at a convenient time. Life cuts off your strength. All of a sudden, I'm in a place where my flesh is as weak as it had ever been, and I was forced to lean on God. And what I want to tell you tonight is that you need to come to the place where you realize before you have to experience something catastrophic, before you have to realize that you are weak by some kind of terrible event happening in your life, some kind of crippling anxiety or depression, suicidal thoughts, before you have to hit rock bottom, please acknowledge your weakness and come to the Lord tonight. Maybe, you're, maybe you've been saved for a long time, but you, you've been leaning on your own abilities, on your own strength. I want you, every single person in this place needs to realize that our flesh is weak. But though our flesh is weak, his spirit is strong in us. And we need to learn to lean. Everybody say that, learn to lean. Learn to lean is the greatest gift I could have ever gotten is, is to become as weak as I have been the last month so that I was forced to lean on his strength. I'll never forget this lesson. My entire life, I'll never forget this lesson. In fact, it took everything in me to preach tonight because I was terrified, absolutely terrified. And you know what? The Lord is with me, and the Lord has been faithful to me, and the Lord has encouraged me, and the Lord has empowered me. And as soon as I get up here and I do what I'm called to do, and, and God, God takes over and I, all the nerves leave, the anxiety leaves, the thoughts leave, all of a sudden now, because I'm in the presence of God, because I put it all in his hands, guess what? He's taking care of everything. We all need to learn to lean in our life. We all need to learn to lean. And so now we come to the end of Samson's story. If we could have uh, the worship team come back up. Actually, just John would be fine just to play keys. Come to the end of Samson's story. They cut off his hair, and the strength he was so used to having, it disappeared. They made him a slave. The Bible says they gouged his eyes out, and they forced him to, to mill uh, their grain for them with their eyes gouged out, and they would laugh at him and mock him. And it looked like it was over. It looked like everything was done for Samson. It looked like, well, this is it. I had strength for so and so amount of years, and this is just it. This is the way it's going to end. I'm going to be a slave. I'm going to be laughed at. I'm going to be blind for the rest of my life. I'm going to be weak for the rest of my life. And that is the voice of Satan in all of our lives. This is never going to end. Your situation is hopeless. This, it's never going to change. This addiction is never going to change. This hopelessness is never going to change. Your depression is never going to change. You're never going to experience the joy of, that God wants to promise you. You're never going to experience peace. Give up trying. The devil is, is so used to saying these things because they work. But the reality is, is that we have a living hope.
in Jesus Christ. And when we learn to lean on his strength, we can be set free from all those things. And so here Samson is, he's weak, he's blind, he's being laughed at, he's, he's a slave. And we come to the end of his life in, in the book of Judges 16. It says, then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars which support the temple and watch this so that I can lean on them. It took all this in Samson's life to learn to lean on something stronger than himself. He said, take me to the pillars. Take me to the pillars of the temple that he was in and lean me up against them because I can't stand on my own. And the temple he was in was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. About 3,000 men and women on the roof were, were watching while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines before my two eyes. It took all this in Samson's life for him to crumble, for him to learn to lean. And now for the first time in his life, he doesn't take things into his own hands. He calls out to the Lord. He says, Lord, my strength is obviously not enough. I pray that you would come and give me your strength once more so that I can avenge myself for all the things that have taken place in my life. And the Bible says that with his hands on the pillars, his hair had been growing and he regained his strength. Regained his strength. That was the last hair pun. He regained his strength with his hands on the pillars. And the Bible says he pushed them with all of his might after he had prayed until they collapsed. And then the Bible says in verse 30, so the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life because God is an expert redeemer. God is able to redeem your weakness. God is able to redeem your failures. God is able to redeem your lowest low for his glory and for your good. And that's exactly what he did in Samson's life. Samson came to the end. He called out. And God used Samson to kill more in his death than he had in his life. And I want to tell you this tonight. There is more victory found in your struggle than there is in your strength. There's more life found in the valley than there is in the mountain. So I promise you, next time you find yourself in a valley, next time you find yourself in a low point, maybe you're there right now. Maybe your situation around you is intimidating you and scaring you and, and it's put this fear in you, this anxiety in you. Maybe you've, you've just been in this low for a long time. Maybe it's something new. It doesn't matter whether you're on the mountaintop or the valley. I, I, I want you to realize that next time you're in the valley, never pray that it would just pass you by. Never pray that God would just take you out, but pray that God would use it to take something out of you. Pray that that situation would bring you closer to him. Pray that God would redeem that valley, that he would redeem that depression, that he would redeem that anxiety so that you could be raised up and help somebody else who's struggling with the same thing that you just got free from because you learned to lean. And maybe your life is great right now. And if it is, I'm, I'm really happy for you. Please understand that. I don't want you to experience a catastrophic event in your life that breaks you down to nothing. I don't want to see anybody have to go through addiction. I don't want to see anybody have to lose somebody or something. I don't want to see you depressed. I don't want to see you filled with anxiety, but I, I want you to know that underneath your thin veil of strength is a vessel of weakness that needs to be exposed. And that can happen one of two ways. It can happen right here, right now, just by simply acknowledging that you are weak and that you need to lean on his strength. Or it can happen by God using something in your life. God didn't give me my anxiety, but I tell you what, he used my anxiety. And he may not have given you your depression. I'm sure he didn't. He's a good God. He doesn't give evil gifts, but he will use your depression. He didn't kill your loved one, but he will use the death of your loved one to bring you closer to him. He will use everything that the devil meant for evil, for good in your life. He will redeem because he's an expert redeemer. My prayer is that you come to depend on Christ right now before you have to endure some kind of painful exposure like Samson has experienced, like I've experienced, like so many people in this room have experienced. And so with that being said, I just want everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're in this place right now and you've been in a low point and you don't know if you can make it out and you feel like you're alone, and you feel like you're broken 
and that there's no hope that this is never going to change. If you find yourself in a low point right now, I just want you to slip up your hand. Nobody's looking around, but we're going to pray for you. Lift your hands over this room and count of three. One, two, three. So many hands. We all struggle. There's no shame in struggling. Father, I pray in Jesus' name over every person struggling in this room right now that you would fill them with your strength and your courage and your boldness and your spirit, Lord, that you would help them not to lean on their own understanding, not to lean on their own strength. But I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would encounter them right now with your love, with your presence, with your peace, with your joy. I pray that you'd overcome depression in this room in Jesus' name. We call out depression. We call it evil. We call it out. In Jesus' mighty name, we cast out depression and anxiety in this room in Jesus' name right now. We cast out hopelessness in Jesus' name right now. And in its place, we speak all the fruit of the Spirit. We speak love, peace, joy. We speak self-control. We speak patience. We speak kindness and goodness. We speak all the things that you have to give us, Lord. We speak hope in a hopeless situation right now. We speak life in a dead situation. We speak resurrection in every tomb right now in Jesus' name by the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ. Right now, resurrect dead spaces, Lord. Resurrect dead souls. Resurrect dead dreams. Resurrect dead emotions. God, resurrect the things in our heart that we've pushed away, that we've pushed down, that we've never dealt with. I pray that you'd come and that you would do a deep healing work in this room like they have never experienced before in their life. You are the great binder of hearts, Jesus. You are the one that can heal brokenness in our bodies, in our emotions, in our soul. You can do it, Lord. And tonight we say we lean on you. Lord, for every person struggling, for every person on a mountaintop, we all collectively come together tonight and we say, Lord, our strength is not enough. I need your strength. I need to lean on you. I lean not on my own understanding. I lean not on my own goodness, on my own ways, on my own power, on my own abilities, on my own walk, on my own life on my own time. I, I lean not on my own self, but I lean on the one who is higher, the one who is stronger, the one who has the name above every other name, the name of Jesus Christ. And at that name, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And tonight, Lord, we come to you humbly and say, God, we need your strength in this place. We ask that you'd come, redeem every weakness, redeem every pit. And I ask you, Lord, that you would expose us, expose our hearts so that we could come to repentance, so that we could come to life, so that we could come to you and find redemption for our soul, to find redemption for our situation. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. With heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you're in this room and you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never said, Jesus, I can't save myself. I need the work of the cross. I need what you did to cleanse me of my sin, to save me, to make me a new creation, to give me a place in heaven. I can't earn my way there. It's only by your grace and by your blood. If you've never given your life to Jesus right now, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Raise your hand up high, raise it boldly. Raise it boldly. Jesus has seen you. The, all, the Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when one person comes to the kingdom, when one person comes to salvation, when one person comes to Jesus. Let's all of us as a family of believers come together. Let's repeat this prayer after me. Before we repeat this prayer, I want to remind you it's not the prayer that saves us. It's not our words that save us. It's Jesus that saves us. So when you repeat this prayer, don't repeat it to yourself or to me. Repeat it to Jesus. Close your eyes and everybody repeat this with those people that want to give their life to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life and to redeem my brokenness. I confess that I'm a sinner and I need you to save me. I'm not strong enough or powerful enough or good enough to earn salvation for myself. So I lean on you tonight. I believe that you died. I believe that you rose again. And from this day forward, you have my heart. You have my life. You have control. Never looking back. In Jesus' name, make me a brand new creation. This is my new beginning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we give a great erupting praise for these people that have just given their lives to Jesus?